I would like to give a warm welcome to all of you. In this video, I would like to continue with the topic from the last video. I will show you a few guidelines, a few ground rules, when to exchange pieces and why to exchange pieces. In the last video, we already saw that we should change pieces if we have material up or if we have a better structure. The reason is simple because the more pieces we change, the clearer these features will be shown and we reach good endgames. Well, on the other hand, if we have material down, if we have worse structure, we should avoid to change pieces. We should keep as many pieces as possible and play on the dynamic features of the position. But there are a few more situations where we can say if we want to change pieces or we don't want to. For example, if we want to highlight one specific criteria of the position, one specific feature, for example, a good knight against a bad bishop. The more pieces we change, the clearer this feature of the position will be shown. So if we have this good knight against a bad bishop, we want to change as many pieces as possible until only those two remain. Well, if we have the bad bishop, we should keep as many pieces as possible so that the difference between the good knight and the bad bishop is not that important. But there are more scenarios where pieces should be changed or shouldn't. For example, sometimes we should change a piece that is covering a lot of squares. For example, the fianchetto bishop of our opponent. Once this piece will be changed, immediately the squares around this piece will be weak. But there are also other cases where we should do this, especially if one piece is defending a lot of squares. Then simply if we exchange this piece, those squares will be weak. But let's get to some practical examples. In this position it's black's move, but we will see this position from white side. Black played a bit carelessly c5. Actually he should have played knight pd7. We will see briefly why knight pd7 was the correct choice. The main feature of this position is that white has a good knight, for example, this knight, or it can be also another knight, but the bad bishop is the bishop on e7. On the queen side, a5 pawn and b4 pawn, they are already on black squares. Well, probably sooner or later, c5 pawn will also be on a black square. So this bishop is bad. And with this bad bishop, black should keep as many pieces as possible. And the way to do this was knight bd7. In the game, he carelessly went c5. And it gave white the opportunity to use his chance and change as many pieces as possible. So he took on c5, e c5, and he took the queen. The rook has to take, and white continues to change pieces, he goes a rook d1. Black tries his best to keep as many pieces as possible, and goes knight bd7. But it's already a bit too late, because queens got exchanged, and soon many more pieces will go off until this knight will stay with this bishop. White continues with his plan, he goes ab, ab, and he plays knight d5, changing a few more pieces. Black takes on g2, king takes g2, he goes rook c8. He wants to keep the d-file kind of closed so that a bit more pieces stay on, but white has a nice idea, he takes on d7, takes back and he goes rook d3, with the idea to bring the other rook as well. And after knight b8, white had this good opportunity to go knight b6. And after rook c6, he could enter with his rook on 7th rank. Black took on d3 and after ed3, bishop d8, knight a4, white had already clear advantage, he could go d4, followed by rook b7, picking up the weak b4 pawn and getting a completely winning endgame. So white converted a slight advantage into a winning position just by exchanging pieces. And if we see in the beginning this bishop on e7, it didn't look so bad, because so many more pieces were still on the board. But once all these pieces get exchanged and we reach a position like here, for example, we already see that this bishop doesn't have a good life. It will all the time be only there to protect c5 as well as b4. 
So we see the more pieces that I exchanged, the bigger will be the difference between the good knight and the bad bishop. Let's go to the next example. And we see a quite similar scenario, it's white's move. And the main feature of the position is again, white has a good knight on c2, which eventually will jump to d4, while the bishop on d7 makes a rather sad impression. White knows about these ground rules and he goes for the exchange. He wants to exchange as many pieces as possible so that the difference between the knight on c2 or on d4, c will and the bishop on d7 will be even bigger. So what would be Black's right way to take back on e4? We know already if you have this bad bishop, you should keep as many pieces as possible on the board. Therefore, the correct choice for black is d takes e4. He can play bishop e8, bishop h5 later on, controlling the d file a bit, and then, depending on white's play, he can either play on the d file or on the g file. Anyway, his position would be rather unpleasant and probably difficult to defend, but nevertheless, it wouldn't be hopeless. I mean, there's a chance that sooner or later he will get some counterplay, and yeah, anyway, it was the best he could do. But in the game, black went carelessly fe4 and gives the opportunity to white to change even more pieces along the f-file. Now white was playing a very strong move. He didn't just take on f8 simply, which would be also possible followed by some rook f1 maybe. But then again, this black queen would get active while white's queen is spit out and black would get some counter chances. The right way to go, as in the game, was rook f6. The obvious move that this rook move is preparing is rook f1, double on the f-file and sooner or later exchange everything. The point behind this rook f6 is that black cannot really take on f6, because after e f6, the queen has a very nice square on e5, his knight can go to d4, and the rook will enter the position, maybe via the g-file. Anyway, I mean, now after this e f6, there are many ways for white to enter the position and to get a winning position. So black can't take on f6, he has to go rook f7, white continues doubling, and after rook c f8, white goes knight d4. Preparing queen f2, and again there's a tactical point behind all this, rook f6, e f6 is good for white, because if queen f7 it's pretty similar to the things I was explaining just before, white's queen will enter sooner or later, for example, knight can return to e2 and then queen will come. And rook f6 was not possible because knight c6 is simply winning the game. So black goes king g7 and forces this rook on f6 to declare himself. But anyway, white's idea is to change pieces, so he takes on f7, takes on f7, queen f7, queen f2. And after queen f2, king f2, white's position is simply winning. White's idea is to push g pawn and the h pawn, come with the king, support this, get the pass pawn on the king side eventually sacrifice this pass pawn to enter with the king. I will not show this endgame in detail because it's outside of our coverage of the exchange theme, but you can try it out for yourself. The important thing for us was that by exchanging all the pieces, the difference between this knight on d4 and the bishop on d7 got really big. In the beginning, of course, it was nice position for white. But if black plays d4, he still has a lot of potential to fight. But after fe4, it's practically forced that all other pieces will be changed and white gets into a winning endgame. Let's move on to the next example. And here it's white's move. White is a bit better but the position of all is pretty symmetrical. White is a few moves up, 
Rook is already on d1 and this is his move. But how to improve his position? And why to exchange the fear and get the bishop? First of all, a6 will be weak once the bishop is exchanged. Second of all, there are a lot of squares around this bishop that will be weak. For example, b7 will be weak, c6 will be weak. And the only question is where to move the knight from f3 to do this exchange. Knight d1 is a very decent move. Knight d2 is another decent move to achieve this goal. But probably the best move is knight g5. It's like the most forcing move and the knight can either go to e4 later on or even there are some tricks with queen d3, double attack on d7 and h7. And we see after bishop takes g2, king g2 and queen g5, rook d7, a6 pawn will be weak, but also there's the idea of queen f3 and queen v7. Of course, there's also rook d1 to double on the d5. But we see this queen f3, queen b7 idea is making use of the weakened white squares on black's queen side. What's the difference? Because also white exchanged his fianchetto bishop, but white didn't weaken his squares. First of all, the king took the place of the fianchetto bishop and king is covering the h3 square as well as the f3 square. And there's also the queen on e2. The queen on e2, it will go on the long diagonal and it will replace this bishop in some way. And another important feature is that black doesn't have any piece to use this weakness of white's king side. His own queen is a bit far away to use it and anyway she would be only alone. So we see this huge difference between the exchange of both fianchetto bishops because in black's camp the weak squares can be attacked and cannot be defended. Let's take a look for one more example. In this position it's black's move, the bishop on g7 is hanging, he went bishop h8. Let us go into this position. If you still remember, in the beginning of this whole series I told you the theme of exchange is a very positional one and very strategic one. And now I show you a very complex position. White is a piece down, white has three pawns for this piece, but these pawns are shattered all over the board. And it seems like that this position just requires calculation, pure calculation. The one who goes deeper into the position, calculates more, will emerge as the winner. But that's not the case. Still in this kind of positions, it makes sense to think strategically. To think a bit like which pieces are strong, which pieces are weak. For example, we see that white squares are perfectly covered in black's camp. The bishop on e6 is covering white squares. The knight on e3 is covering a lot of white squares. The queen on e8 is covering also a million of light squares. So basically all these light squares are covered by several pieces. While on the other hand, there are only one and a half pieces that are covering some black squares. There's this bishop on h8 covering a lot of black squares and the knight on d7 covering a few. But besides these two pieces, there are no more pieces here to cover these squares. So it's very logical for white to try to use these squares. And the way to do this is to go bishop c3, force the exchange of this bishop on h8. And after bishop c3, queen c3, we see that black is in huge trouble. Queen g7 is a threat, queen h8 is a threat. The only way to defend is queen f7. But after queen d4, queen g8, white continued the theme to play on the black squares with rook c5, offering the exchange sacrifice, but black cannot really take on c5 because he will be in huge trouble after d7 or even after queen takes c5. If black cannot take on c5, white has clear advantage. The way how to win this game exactly is again outside of the scope of this video. It was just important to note that even in some tactical position we can think strategically, we can employ the ideas that we saw. 
Let's just recap once what we saw in these last two videos. We can exchange for a couple of reasons. For example, if we are material up, we should change. If we have the beta structure, we should change pieces as well. We can convert our beta structure into a better endgame. Then we should change pieces if we want to highlight one special feature of the position. For example, if we want to highlight a good knight against a bad bishop. And then we should also change pieces if we want to weaken a whole set of squares in our opponent's camp. This is especially possible if the opponent only has one piece that is covering all those squares. While on the other hand, if we are material down, or if we have a worse structure, we should not change pieces. We should keep as many pieces as possible and rely on the dynamic features of the position. If we have a bad bishop against a good knight, we don't want this thing is being highlighted and we want to keep as many pieces as possible to keep the difference between the good knight and the bad bishop as small as possible. And finally, if we have only a few pieces that are covering a lot of squares, we really need to take care that those pieces won't be exchanged. Now we are already at the end of the video series. I hope you enjoyed the ideas about exchanging pieces. I wish you a lot of success and a lot of fun employing those ideas in your games. And I hope to see you in another video series of mine. Goodbye.